International Dhamma Teaching. The spirit of the Buddha's teaching leads to a beautiful and happier life. Wandami to all Sangha attending this event. Good evening everyone. Suki Hondu, Namo Buddhaya, Amitofo, Tashi Delek. Keluarga Cendekiawan Buddhis Indonesia or KCBI, Indonesian Buddhist Council Association, Walubi, organize a series of Dharma hmm. teaching to welcome Vesak 25 and 56 Buddhist era. A special series started from 10 April with Fun Master Hengshir from Chan Tradition in Queensland, Australia. His Eminence 12 Jurmang Garwang Rinpoche on 17 April. Last week, We were honored by the compassion from Venerable Lungpa in Tawai Santusako Mahatera, giving us the Dhamma. Today, the opportunity to listen to the Dhamma continues with Venerable Achan Jayasaro. My name is Edward. I will be today's MC along with my friend Justin and speaking mainly in English. Venerable Achan will speak in English too, but we have a team of translators in the background. For English participants, you may stay in the main channel. For those who need other direct translations, you will see the interpretations options on your Zoom menu. You can choose either Bahasa Indonesia or Thai as you prefer. This event will last for about one and a half hours. Participants can start submitting your questions from now because Achan will answer more from your questions. Please submit your question in the Q&A box you find in your Zoom menu. You may type in your preferred language. Please make sure your questions to the point and related to the Dhamma. Before we continue, we will sing Indonesian National Anthem and KCBI hymn. Yang 
Good evening, everyone. We apologize as we have some technical difficulties that we would like to solve for now. Good evening, Achan. This is Jessica. So um, this evening, I will be the one who translate from English to Bahasa Indonesia. And the host will be from Edward and Justin. I just want to let you know that we have the slot uh, until 8 p.m. Jakarta time, but uh, uh, we will be following uh, your guidance. So if it's, it should end before 8 or after 8, it's okay with us. Thank you, Achan. Achan, can you please, um, maybe we can uh, start with check the sound to make sure that we can hear your voice. Oh, one, two, three, five, okay. seven, eleven. <laughs> Perfect, Achan. Thank you. Okay, I shall give back to the MC, Edward. Okay, thank you. I will now read brief profile of Venerable Achan Jayasaro. Fen Achan Jayasaro was born in the Isle of Wight, England in 1958. In 1978, he became a student of Ajahn Chah, one of Thailand's most renowned Buddhist monks and meditation masters at Wat, pa, Wat Nong Papong in Northeast Thailand. He took full ordination with Ajahn Chah as his preceptor in 1980. After his initial five-year monastic training, Achan Jayasaro spent time in solitary retreat before taking on teaching and administrative duties. Over the next several years, he alternated between periods of retreat and service to his monastic lineage, during which period he was interested with writing the official biography of his teacher, Achan Cha. Achan Jayasaro served as a board of Wat Pa Nanachat the International Monastery of Achan Chas Lineage for five years, from 1997 until 2002. Since then, he has been living at Janamara Hermitage at the foot of Khao Yai Mountains in Nakorn Ratchasima, Thailand. He now combines his own spiritual practice with regular offerings of guidance to lay and monastic communities in Thailand and overseas. Without further ado, I would like to welcome our teacher today, Venerable Achan Jayasaro. Please, Achan. Uh, 
Uh, so good evening uh, to everyone who is in this time zone and greetings to everyone in other time zones. So um, the, the theme of these teachings I've been told is um, how the Buddha's teaching leads to a beautiful and happier life. I'm not so sure that I really know what a beautiful life is, but I am reminded of a theme that I first um, discovered or an idea that I first discovered as a school student in the study of English literature. And that was the idea that beauty is truth. And I think from a Buddhist perspective, that is an idea that I would still support today. Similarly, the question of happiness is <laughs> the question of happiness is um, not such a straightforward one, but I would say again that ultimately the Buddhist understanding is that happiness is truth or um, the realization of truth is the realization of true happiness and that any happiness based on falsehood or misunderstanding will not be a reliable kind of happiness. So um, these two words, beauty, and happiness can be seen from Buddhist perspective as different ways of talking about truth and the realization of truth. So in the modern academic um, tradition of postmodernism, then there is um, a skepticism a, an opposition to the very idea that there is something called truth, a universal truth that can be realized. But here the Buddhist tradition is very clear. There is a universal truth that can be realized. And that realizing that truth enables to under, us to experience true happiness. And in the light of this understanding, we can define dukkha, usually translated as suffering, as the absence of true happiness. The cessation of dukkha is the realization of true happiness. We believe that it is um, a wonderful opportunity to be born as a human being. Although Buddhism is often represented as a pessimistic philosophy. In fact, I would argue that it is the most optimistic um, kind of philosophy or view in that our confidence, our faith is in the capacity, the potential of the human being 
to realize truth and thus to realize true happiness. Our happiness is not contingent, is not dependent upon a deity or a God or some external power, but through taking birth in the human realm, we have the potential to realize true happiness. So we begin from a very humble position and acknowledge that we do not really know what happiness means. We don't really know what the truth is, but our great gift and our strength as human beings is that we are learners. This is um, the main evolutionary feature, I believe, our ability to learn, our love of learning. And learning from each other has been a major source of human progress. So we are learning and we are learning from the Buddha, someone who has realized the profound truth of existence and has revealed this truth to all of us. But he has not revealed the truth as a metaphysical principle, as a philosoph philosophical principle. But his approach has always been very practical. And the simile here would be of eating some, wanting to taste bread, for instance, take a Western example. So the Buddha is not going to, he does not spend a lot of time speaking in a very mystical way about the taste of bread, but he's very practical. He says, this is what you need to make bread. You need flour, you need water, you need yeast, uh, you need salt, and so on. And this is uh, what you have to do with those ingredients. You have to knead them in this such a way until they gain such a consistency. And then you put them in the oven at such a temperature for such a period of time. And then you take out the bread and you taste it and you'll know for yourself. So this is the approach of Theravada Buddhism, in particular, always very practical, start off from where you are, not where you would like to be, start off at the bottom of the ladder, don't start the teachings at the top of the ladder, because you're not there yet. So it's a very humble approach. And we need to recognize that this is a gradual training, but one which is based upon continuity of effort. If there is any special um, secret to practice it, well, it's an open secret, it's, it's consistency and continuity of practice. And practice here means being awake and aware and being ready to learn from experience. So um, this, for instance, this, this session was scheduled for 
in the evening. And we had some technical difficulties. So that was your practice for those 10 minutes or 15 minutes. How did you feel about that? Were you disappointed? Were you irritated? Um, how did you feel? Did you observe that? And, and did you realize that that was part of the teaching this evening? How to deal with the unpredictability and the unreliability of um, technical systems. So having that interest and readiness, not saying, well, I'll start to practice when I close my eyes or I, I meditate under such and such conditions, but it's all of life. So we can't um, describe happiness, but we can experience happiness. We can't really describe unhappiness so well, but we can, we can experience it. So we're turning our attention towards it and observing. And we observe, for instance, that certain kinds of um, speech, certain kinds of action leave a trace in our, in our hearts. Afterwards, our hearts feel a little bit dirty, a little bit sullied, not clean, not bright. And that's an indication um, of the importance of taking care of our actions and speech. Because even if we are familiar and, and adept at certain meditation practices, techniques, if we are acting and speaking in unkind, unmindful ways, then we're never going to make real progress in practice because the path of, of the Buddha is a holistic path. It's one in which there must be complete harmony between action, speech, and mind. So we can observe that when we act unkindly, when we take advantage of others, when we um, vent our frustration and anger on the people around us, that it has an effect. Um, it, immediate effect is that we are causing pain and suffering for others, but at the same time, we are, um, we are accumulating this bad karma and we lose um, our sense of self-respect. We find it very difficult to be friendly to ourselves, to like ourselves. If we are not careful about the quality of our actions and speech. So this is an observation that we can make. This is part of the, the Buddhist path that we see that certain actions, certain speech um, prevent us from re realizing any sense of well-being. And without self-respect, then the most basic foundation of happiness is lost. If we live in a family or community where people are not careful and mindful of their actions and speech, there is a lack of trust and there can be no happiness in a community where people don't trust each other. 
So these are the observations we make. This is our practice of observing the connections between things, how things affect each other. So the ultimate happiness of Nibbana, of the freedom from all defilement, is preceded by many other lesser but important foundational kinds of happiness. Giving, sharing is one of the most immediate sources of happiness in our life. And we can observe again that if we give something with a wish, a hope for something in return, then it does make us very happy in the long run. If after some time we recollect, we remember the occasion when we helped somebody, when we gave something, um, but we wanted something in return, maybe we wanted their respect or we want some, um, <clears throat> some uh, increase of our reputation or some love or we were anything at all that we hope for as a result of our giving means that the memory is the memory of a transaction. It's not the memory of dana, of true giving. And so it does not uplift our mind. It doesn't make us happy. But if you've done some good deed, you've done some kindness, you've made some sacrifice for others with no hope at all of any kind of reward, then if you recollect that goodness after one month or one year or even 10 years, you feel happy, you feel uplifted. And this is what we call merit. It's a merit uplifts the mind. So the practice is not of blindly believing in the Buddha's teachings, but have put it, the Buddha's teaching to the test of experience. Some of the, um, we take on certain beliefs, but we take them on not as dogmas, things to blindly believe, but as pointers and as things that we should try to prove whether or not they are true in our own life, in our own experience. So the Buddha is challenging us, look, look and see, is this true? That giving without desire for reward gives true um, and lasting sense of well-being, happiness that keeping precepts and being mindful and careful about how you treat the people around you gives rise to self-respect, gives rise to trust. It gives rise to happy communities. But the practice of dana and sila are not complete in themselves because they only deal with the expressions of ignorance, but don't get at the root cause of our suffering or our lack of true happiness. For that, we need to look more profoundly into the nature of the body and mind in meditation. 
So the Buddhist view is that there is a truth that can be known, a universal truth, but it can only be known by a mind which is free of the five hindrances. So the five hindrances are five particular defilements that appear, are provoked, are revealed through meditation practice. So the, um, the indulgence in thoughts and memories and imagination of things that we like, the indulgence in memories and thoughts, imagination about things and people we don't like, and the stiffness and dullness, laziness of the mind, the agitation, the anxiety, in the mind, doubts in the mind. So the Buddha has said that there is such a thing as truth, and the more clearly you see, the more happy you become. But your ability to see the truth, penetrate the truth, is dependent on the qualities of your mind. An untrained mind is not capable. It's not a good enough tool. It's not a refined instru an instrument which is uh, refined enough to experience this truth. So this is why meditation practice play such an important part. It's not that meditation is um, like the magic jewel which um, answers all your wishes. It's just one part of the overall education that the Buddha taught us, which we call the Eightfold Path, but it is the heart of the practice. And without it, the mind never gains the strength and the uh, clarity and the peace which is necessary for a true um, perception of the way things are. So the practice is one of recognizing the five khandhas as the body, as the body, feelings as feelings, perceptions as perceptions, thoughts, uh, intentions, thoughts, intentions, emotions, to see them as just that much, no more, no less, sense consciousness is just that much, not more, not less. This is the nature. This is the selfless nature of the body and mind. And we can only see that clearly when the mind has been trained consistently, systematically. Then the ways in which we create suffering for ourselves become apparent and we can let go. So suffering is not something that is forced upon us. Whatever the external condition might be, there can be no suffering without some inner contribution. So it's the external condition, external um, trigger, plus the internal uh, ignorant response or reaction, which leads to suffering, lack of true happiness. 
by developing the ability to look closely, look clearly, to be aware in the present moment, then we learn how to let go of this internal ignorant reaction to phenomena. So what then whatever the external situation might be, it can cause us some discomfort and some physical distress, but it cannot cause mental suffering because the internal ingredient is no longer there. And the more that we let go of the internal condition, then we observe something very interesting. That is that fewer and fewer things make us suffer and more and more things make us happy. We can find simple menial jobs like sweeping and cleaning and um, as very satisfying activities, washing clothes or all the menial jobs that people look down upon can actually be a source of uh, great joy, pleasure we become much more sensitive to the goodness of people around us. We appreciate goodness. We, we become like connoisseurs of goodness. Even the smallest acts and words of goodness uh, feed this joy in our heart because our hearts are clearer now. They're cleaner now. So it's like before you're driving in a car with the windscreen covered with dirt and you just thought that was, that was normal. And then one day someone, you wipe the windscreen and suddenly you can see through the windscreen uh, and it's a whole different world. So the chasing after forms and sounds and odors and tastes. This is a very narrow way of living life as a human being. It may seem really uh, wonderful and, uh, you know, uh, exotic, but it's not. It's just the same old thing again and again and again and again. Forms and sounds and odors and tastes and so you can have a sweet taste and a bitter taste and a this taste and a that taste. But at the end of the day, it's just that's all it is. It's just taste. So having the money and the power to be able to experience all kinds of incredible forms and sounds is not a lifetime of freedom and happiness. It's a prison. Uh, you're in the prison, the open prison of the senses. But it's only through the cultivation of the Buddhist path that you can realize that inner freedom and the happiness that comes through liberation from defilement. So I would like to end the Dhamma talk at this point. Anumodana Achan for the beautiful sharing. We hope that everyone here 
in a Zoom conference, the team, the volunteers, and all participants in the Zoom conference uh, can find the true definition of true happiness. Currently, we have received some questions from the participants of the event. So the first question, Ajahn, if I may ask, intellectually, we understand the concept of non-self, but the teaching states that we need to meditate to realize this. Could Achan explain what is meant by realize this? What would one experience? Thank you. Uh, please wait for a moment as there seems to be a technical difficulties from the Achan. Now Achan will answer the question. Uh, good evening, Achan. Maybe you can, uh, maybe you can repeat the questions one again. Okay, sure. Uh, Achan, I will repeat the question one more time. So the first question is, Achan, if I may ask, intellectually, we understand the concept of non-self, but the teaching states that we need to meditate to realize this. Could Achan explain what is meant by realize this and what would, what would one experience? Thank you. Uh -huh. Anatta or, or not self is um, not a, a state to be realized. It's the, it means seeing through the mistaken assumption that we make about ourselves, about our lives, because we have not really looked closely enough. We have just assumed certain things about ourselves. For instance, we, we have this word I and me, and we use these words many times every day. And because we use this word in referring to ourselves again and again, we take it for granted. It seems to be common sense that there is something there called I or me. But the Buddha asked us to look more closely to so where is this I or me? Is it found in the body? Is it found in feelings? Is it found in perception? Is it found in thought, emotion? Is it found in sense consciousness? And when we start looking for this thing that we call I, which seems the most obvious thing in our life, you know, the one thing that is like the base for our whole existence, we have, we have a strange discovery. We, 
we can't find it. The teaching of anatta points to the lack of power over the different elements of our life. The words of Ajahn Chah, you know, if this body was really yours, you could tell your body, don't get old, don't get sick, don't die. But you can't, why can't you, if it's your body? Because the definition of ownership is that you have power over that thing that you own. Feeling is the same. If you're having a, a bad feeling, you can't just tell yourself, stop having this bad feeling. I don't want this bad feeling, I want a good feeling. You have a perception of something as beautiful or ugly or whatever. You can't say, I want to have this kind of perception. I don't want to have that kind of perception. With thought, there's a thought uh, pops into your head. You can't say, I want to be a good person. I want to be a nice person. I don't want to have any cruel, nasty thoughts in my mind ever again. I'm just going to be, have good, kind, compassionate thoughts in my mind from now on. Now, if thought was really you and really yours, you could do that perhaps. But thought just pops up into our mind. And we don't know even one second beforehand what you're going to be thinking. You know, have you ever considered that? We just don't know even one second before what the next thought is going to be. So when something uh, appears at the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, then there is sense consciousness arising at that particular sense base. So the Buddhist approach is not one of um, expounding a philosophy called anatta, but the Buddha is saying, you are starting off, you are looking at life with a wrong assumption. You are assuming that there is something called a self, yourself, who you really are. But you cannot find that self, can you? What is really going on? And so when we look more closely, look more profoundly, we see a stream. It's like life is a river. It's a river of physical phenomena, mental phenomena, a flow. But it's not a random flow. It's a flow that is dependent on causes and conditions. So another way of talking about anatta is simply to say that everything arises and passes away according to causes and conditions. So it's, it's a different way, it's a particular way of approaching the uh, phenomena of causality. He's saying that there is no controller. There is no one behind this. 
it's a natural phenomena um, that is dependent on causes and conditions. So we're looking at this both in daily life, in daily experience, and also in meditation. So these two have to go together. So the more profound realization comes in meditation when the mind has entered samadhi and has left the five hindrances behind. But we also need to supplement that kind of practice with daily life practice. And it's not difficult, it's just being awake to what's going on. So you, you walk out into the sun and your body feels hot and maybe you start to sweat. Well, you didn't want to get hot. You didn't want to sweat. It's not your, your decision. It just happened because of the nature of the physical body. If you're in the hot sun, then there is an unpleasant tone to that experience. It's called Vetana. There are certain memories, certain perceptions that arise in the mind, certain thoughts, and observing and learning from the way that things arise and pass away, the patterns that we can um, distinguish in daily life. So in practicing in that way, in daily life, using the intellectual power also, the power of observation, the power of mindfulness, um, then bringing that into meditation, you, have, you can sustain powerful momentum. Thank you, Achan, for the sharing. I will now read the second question. Throughout the journey of discovering truth, one would encounter fear. Fear of the unknown, fear when seeing something that goes against one's preconceived beliefs, fear of observing one's developments overriding despite one's knowing them. What is Achan's advice on the matter of overcoming fear so that one will continue the practice and stop halfway in despair or frustration. Thank you. Permit. Some are uh physiological. Um, I remember many years ago reading a transcript of a Dhamma talk given by one of the great um, masters in Thailand, Lungta Mahabua. And he relates how he was walking in the forest and almost um, stepped on a poisonous snake, a cobra or a king cobra, I can't remember, and how he immediately jumped back. And his uh, comment was uh, very interesting to me because his, his comment was, well, even an arahant uh, can experience that kind of reaction to uh, suddenly being um, confronted with a poisonous snake. Now, quite recently, um, in a book on neuroscience, I came across an interesting passage um, in which they said they discovered a certain area of the brain its only function of this particular area of the brain is to 
um, to promote or to stimulate a very powerful reaction to the sight of a snake, a poisonous snake. So Lungta Mahabur was, was correct. It was a purely physiological reaction that there's, uh, you know, he has that area of his brain and that's what sprung into action. It's something that has been in the human brain going back for a very long time. But in general matters, um, I think, first of all, it is also important to distinguish between fear and anxiety. So fear has like a specific um, object, whereas anxiety is more diffuse, not so clear cut. In Dhamma terms, fear is um, an inseparable um, element of the of the unenlightened mind. It's to say, as long as there is the attachment to body and mind as self, as long as there is Sakaya Ditti, as long as there is this view, this belief, this attachment um, that the five khandhas are me or mine, there will always be fear. Fear and the sense of self are one and the same thing. So the only real liberation from fear is through stream entry and through um, realization of the truth of things. But um, on the path of practice and whether, whether it is fear of snakes or fear of um, uh, pain, fear, whatever the fear might be, or fear of ghosts is a big one here, maybe in Indonesia also, um, then the, the, the practice is to be fully aware of the fear and any strong negative emotion is always intensified by vipavadanha or not wanting to feel that way, not wanting to have to experience that. So there's fear and then there's the not wanting to feel fear. And it's the not wanting that really um, constitutes the, the suffering in many cases. So the uh, tendency of the mind to react towards phenomena in either of two extremes is seen in the case of fear. So one is just to be completely lost in the fear and to totally panic. And the other extreme is to try to repress the fear and try to get rid of it and try to explain it away or whatever. But those two strategies um, are not uh, wise strategies, they don't work. But if we simply establish mindfulness and say, this is fear, it's like this, this is what fear feels like. And we can do one of the body scan meditations where we look at the sensations in the body from the top of the head downwards and try to identify where exactly in the body do I feel fear? What is its specific nature? Is it a stable, permanent feeling? Is it uh, fluctuating, changing? Is its intensity changing? Is its characteristic changing? 
So we adopt the um, stance of the attitude of a scientist, an observer of fear. So we're not fighting fear, we're not uh, getting caught up in fear, but we're aware of fear as a phenomena, as something which is um, manifesting in the body and mind right now. And we're curious, what is this? Now, this is interesting. Let me look at it. What, what is this thing we call fear? And when we change our attitude to fear, and we're not afraid of fear, and we don't resent fear, not angry about it, not oppressed by it, just looking at it, then it dissolves. And seeing how fear and other strong emotions uh, can dissolve in this way is really um, liberating. You give great joy to the mind. So you see, you don't have to do anything. You just have to be present to your experience and just be patient and just to look and be curious. And our tendency is to experience ourselves like a little boat on a stormy sea. You know, we're, we're in this little boat and the storm is raging and we're afraid that our boat is going to capsize. This is little me, it's overwhelming. I can't take it anymore. It's awful, it's terrible. It's your, your little boat on this big ocean. It's so fragile. But then when you look more closely, actually the thought and the emotion is the little boat and you are the ocean. So on the ocean, you have that surface layer of um, activity and agitation, but you go down a few meters and it's still. And so however strong storm might be, the ocean is only affected on its surface layer. And the, the boat is not who you are, it's just a thought, it's just a perception on the surface of the ocean. So changing your way of looking at these emotions and thoughts um, can have a very um, liberating effect. Thank you, Achan, for the sharing. We would like to inform you that there are a total of 12 questions, and right now we are uh, at the third question. So I will now read the third question for you. Would you kindly advise on how to give a simple answer and to be understandable if someone, especially a non-Buddhist, who is asking in regards the meaning of reincarnation after this current time? Thank you. Um, okay. The First of all, I, I wouldn't use the word reincarnation. I don't like that word. Um, we, generally speaking, don't use that word. Um, the, let, let me make a few points uh, about it. If we are talking to a non-Buddhist, the first thing to make clear is that rebirth or reincarnation is not a Buddhist dogma. So the teachings of other religions are generally in the form of dogmas, things that you are expected to believe. If you want to be a Christian or you want to be a Muslim, or, there are certain things that are non-negotiable. You have to believe in these things um, if you want to be a member of those religions. But in, in, in Buddhism, it's rather different. And the Buddhist teachings are essentially an education system. 
and the Buddha made it very, uh, made, put great emphasis on the need to distinguish between what you know and what you believe. So uh, for the vast majority of Buddhists, um, they don't have, we don't have the remembrance, recollection of past lives. We can't say we know there is such a thing as rebirth or reincarnation. So in many traditions, there is, um, I would say, lack of clarity about this. There is the assumption that a strong belief in something is a kind of knowledge that I know and I believe are one and the same things. But the Buddha was um, such a revolutionary teacher in which he said, no, you can believe 100% in things that are not true. Belief is not a proof that what you believe is necessarily true. So when non-Buddhists um, ask Buddhists about reincarnation or rebirth, they're usually assuming that Buddhism is like their religion and they have certain beliefs and the main belief um, that people, everyone knows about Buddhists is we believe in re reincarnation. But if you start talking about reincarnation or rebirth in those kind of terms, as if it was, is a dogma or something that every um, Buddhist has to believe, then you've already uh, lost the, the, the path. You're not explaining correctly. So, it's not simply a matter of saying, well, you believe in this and this. Yeah, we're Buddhists. We believe in reincarnation. Reincarnation is like this. This is what we believe. In that case, uh, we're losing the essential feature of, of Dhamma, of Buddhist teaching. So the, the, the Buddhists to say, Yes, I believe in rebirth, but I have not experienced the truth of it yet. So very humbly make that distinction. But I have reasons for my belief. For example, the words of the Buddha himself, the words of great um, monks and nuns and meditators, who say they can remember past lives. We have the memories of small children all around the world who can uh, have been um, proved, we can say, to have accurate memories of past lives. There are people who can remember past lives under hypnosis. So there is a lot of supportive evidence, but that is not yet a direct experience. Okay, so that's, I haven't got round to the, um, to the explanation yet, but that's some um, supplementary um, reflection on this topic. I think the um, simple, um, most simple way of explaining this is to use uh, ancient simile. Let's suppose we have two candles. And when we light a candle, then we say, what is, what is a candle flame? It's not a thing, is it? What we, what we perceive as a flame 
is in fact a reaction between the wick and the wax and the and the and the oxygen in the atmosphere so there's not a thing called a flame but there are there is a chemical reaction which between various elements which produces something we call a flame now if one candle burns down and then we light a second candle from the first candle then we could say just to 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 speak very simply that the first flame has been um, passed on to the second candle but what has really happened is that there is a continuity of this chemical reaction so there is a process and for that process to continue you need a physical basis in this case so the physical basis of the candle flame meaning the the wick of the candle first candle um, is no longer present then it can be um, sustained by a second candle now why this um, example is good because it shows that there's not a thing it's not like there was a candle flame like number one candle flame died and was reborn as number two candle flame but there is a continuity and rebirth is point to this continuity and saying that the death of the physical body is only the death of one element within this process and it's not a um, absolutely um, fixed element that is to say when this element this physical body is no longer present then this process can manifest in another body according to the kama that we have created We could ask, well, where does the, we know where the physical body comes from, um, comes from the sperm and the egg and the, and the environment and, and all that we've, the nourishment that we take into our body and so on and so forth. But uh, the question is, where does the mind come from? So, the modern science or materialist modern scientists um, believe that the mind is a byproduct of material realities. This is a very um, philosophical position and it's completely unproven. In fact, it's a faith, just like the faith of. Uh, in any religion, because with all of the billions and billions of dollars that have gone into sci uh, scientific research, there are still absolutely no proof, and they're making no progress in proving and showing how material phenomena can give rise to immaterial phenomena, how physical cells can give rise to subjectivity. And so there is a great mystery in our existence as human beings. And the scientific consensus, which, which tries to promote itself as very rational is in fact based upon belief it's it's in many ways it's a religious belief it's not backed up by any evidence 
So rebirth, the idea that there is a stream of kamma, like a stream of energy, if you like, um, which is um, embodied and takes some various manifestations, but is not um, confined to them, um, is the Buddhist answer to this nature of this mystery. So you've asked me for a short and simple answer, and I've given a very long and complicated answer. So <laughs> I think I, I fail on this one. I'll give myself a D plus maybe. Thank you, Achan, for the Dhamma. Uh, right now it's already 8 p.m., but uh, we still have a lot more questions. So would you like to still continue with the questions or uh, we can follow anything that you like to do? Okay, can, can I ask for on, guidance? Go on for a bit longer and uh, make up for the time we lost at the beginning of the session. All right, now I will read out the fourth question that we have. So the fourth question is, if in achieving true happiness, we have to let go of attachment to anyone and anything, while humans are basically social beings who will always need each other, how to approach this wisely from a Buddhist point of view? Thank you. Um, in the in the um, in the Jataka stories, then. Uh, we see that the very last um, obstacle to Buddhahood was the Bodhisattva's love for his family. So this is, you know, recognition um, of just how deep, deeply rooted this is in the human condition of the, Bod the Bodhisattva after all those lifetimes the very last um, defilement to go was his love of family. So um, if we look at the Buddhist tradition, then well, the, the, the teachings of the Buddha um, are often emphasizing self-reliance and becoming one's own refuge. And yet at the same time, there is the famous teaching that the Buddha gave Venerable Ananda and saying that uh, good friendship is not just half of the holy life, it's the whole of the holy life. So the emphasis on Sangha, the emphasis on community, emphasis on creating um, uh, families and communities based upon sila and kindness and compassion and trust. These, uh, these different strands, these different um, dimensions of, of Buddhism um, all um, come together in a very beautiful, harmonious, whole. The, the fact that um, love of personal love, individual love, um, is such a strong part of human psyche is, is recognized. And for this reason, there will only ever be a, a minority of Buddhists um, who are suited to and can really uh, appreciate and enjoy the monastic life uh, where one makes the renunciation of that kind of um, happiness. And there is a recognition that this is a legitimate kind of happiness. And we have examples from the time of the Buddha himself to the present day of householders 
keeping five precepts, leading a normal uh, family life with spouses and children and grandchildren who have been able to realize stream entry. And stream entry means you've done 99.99% of the work that you need to do. The, uh, the Buddha compared the suffering that remains for the stream enterer to the suffering that is, he or she has experienced in the past many lifetimes as the difference between the amount of dirt that you can get trapped under a fingernail with all the earth, all the dirt in the world. So um, family life and family attachments um, are not necessarily a, um, uh, an insurmountable or um, uh, obstacle to progress in Dhamma or even realization of Dhamma. But uh, what is necessary is that there is constant reflection that um, we are, I am of the nature to age. I have not gone beyond aging. I am of the nature to sicken. I have not gone beyond sickness. I am of nature to die. I have not gone beyond dying. I will be separated from everybody that I love. So this is the, this is the reflection that um, we need uh, as householders, need to keep coming back to again and again. This is a temporary um, state of affairs, you know, where uh, no matter how much you love our parents and love our spouses and our children, um, this is an unpredictable, um, uncertain and uh, relationship. And that one day, um, and it could be any day, we're going to be separated from those that we love. So it's not saying you shouldn't love, you shouldn't be attached but to educate your love, to make your love more mature. So it's not a love which is based upon closing your eyes and trying not to think about the fact that one day you'll be separated, but that fully embraces, fully accepts the reality of that impermanence and of that uncertainty. And rather than being filled with dread and suffering and, and depression, when you think that way, quite the opposite happens. And you think you become that much more appreciative of the people in your life and you um, treat them a lot better. You're more forgiving and you, you, your, your love becomes um, a more elevated love is a dhammic love. And as time goes on in, in, in family life, and couples, married couples, you see that um, the sensual and sexual side of the relationship um, becomes less and less central, not so important. And the friendship becomes more and more important and the love just develops naturally um, more and more in, into the four Brahma Viharas of metta and compassion and mudita and, and upeka. So this is a natural evolution of love between uh, couples who are and families who are practicing the Dhamma, the like possessiveness and anxiety around children and their fate and, and wanting to control and wanting to prevent them from realize, from any kind of suffering. This kind of neurotic um, uh, habits that come up so easily in family life um, are uh, steadily abandoned 
and it's more you want to do anything for your child and to um, feel compassion if they're suffering, but there's a recognition of law of kamma, and we all are the owners of our kamma, and there's only so much that one person can do for another person. So the love between families is not like it's this thing you have to get rid of if you're really serious about Dhamma practice. Um, that's not, that's not it. You say honor, you honor your parents, you honor your spouse, you, you, you honor your, all your relationships, but you are evolving them and educating them and bringing them into harmony with the principles of Dhamma. Thank you, Ajahn, for the sharing. Now the fifth question would be, please talk about right mindfulness within one daily formal and informal practice and with interpersonal relationships, whether it be with Dhamma teachers or with global community. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, first of all, I'd like to just make a comment on, on this word right, you know, right view, right um, aspiration, right this, right that. And sometimes non-Buddhists say, oh, you, you Buddhists, you're so conceited. You know, why do you think that you're right and everyone else is wrong? You know, what does this right mean? So I um, like to share this reflection. It's like, let's say you were, you're going to pick up a hammer or you pick up a violin. Now, if, you're, if your aim is simply to keep hold of that hammer or that violin and not let it fall to the ground, then there's no right way to hold it. You can hold it any way you like as long as it doesn't fall. But if you want to hammer a nail into a piece of wood, there is a right way to hold the hammer and a wrong way. If you want to play um, a beautiful piece of music with the violin, then there's a right way to hold the violin and the wrong way. So with the Eightfold Path, with so right view, right aspiration, right mindfulness, then the Buddhist point of view, it is the mindfulness or the, the view, so on, which leads to the goal of Nibbana. So that's why it's right. It's the kind of mindfulness that contributes towards the realization of truth, of Nibbana. Now, right mindfulness um, is, as I said, one, one element of the Eightfold Path, and it can only be practiced correctly when it is practiced within the context of the Eightfold Path. So these days, it, it's very popular to, um, to take some mindfulness practices, techniques, and apply them in daily life and apply them here and there. And it's very fashionable these days. But um, I would say that I'm actually quite appreciative of, of that movement in, in modern world and that um, recognition of the value of, of awareness. Um, it's quite a revolutionary thing in many ways. But for the, for the Buddhist, for it to be right mindfulness, then it has to be um, within the context of the Eightfold Path, beginning with right view, and must be uh, inclined towards um, Nibbana. So for instance, if you're simply... Uh, mindful of anger. Um, that's not necessarily right mindfulness because right mindfulness means mindfulness of anger as a defilement and one which leads you away from Nibbana. 
mindfulness um, is also um, inseparable from clear comprehension or sampajanya. But in many places in the suttas um, and in this definition, sampajanya is just considered as, I think you could say as an aspect of mindfulness. Whereas in some sutta, then they're separated. And we talk about the function of sati and the function of sampajanya. So the, in, in formal practice, mindfulness is accompanied by, or sati, by sampajanya and clear comprehension and atapi. Atapi is a word for effort. And the, uh, the translation of atapi is of the, the, the effort that burns up the defilements or is, but really that's, I think that's um, an idiom. And, and what it really means is the optimum kind of effort to get the job done at that particular moment. So what, what constitutes atapi or effort is, is changes according to the, um, the level of the, of the meditation. So mindfulness, clear comprehension, and right effort. This is how mindfulness is practiced in meditation. So mindfulness here is um, bearing in mind what needs to be borne in mind. So in, in, in meditation, that means not forgetting your meditation object. So uh, in, the, uh, in the text, mindfulness often um, glossed as not forgetting. But it also, there is an element of memory. For instance, in the uh, practice of meditation, you might um, need to recall some tips or some advice or some warnings from your teacher. So the memories you have of how to apply the technique uh, are also um, can be included in, in mindfulness here. But let's say you lose your mindfulness, mind become distracted, and then you realize, oh, I've lost my mindfulness. I've been thinking about lunch or I've been thinking about this or that. And that realization that what you are thinking right now is not what you intended to be thinking about or focusing on, that is sampajanya. You see, this is the wisdom faculty. There's a sense of I'm not um, thinking about what I intended to think about. I've lost my way. That's not mindfulness as such. That's clear comprehension. This clear comprehension has a sense of what the goal is, what the practice is, what, um, how to um, maintain right mindfulness. So it's uh, like a quality control element in the, in the meditation. QC in the meditation is sampajanya. Um, and when sati and sampajanya working well, then the amount of effort, the optimum amount of effort to create that clarity, sharpness and wakefulness in the mind is atapi. In daily life, mindfulness, uh, it's important to recognize that mindfulness is not like a, a quality. You just, I, you have, you don't have this thing called mindfulness. You always have to be mindful of something. And so given the situations are changing all the time, and there are many different things going on, 
you can't maintain one particular object of mindfulness like the breath in daily life. Um, for instance, in a conversation, you know, you can't watch your breath during a conversation. Um, so there has to be a flexibility in daily life and choosing an object uh, of mindfulness, which is most appropriate. Now, the basic object of mindfulness, fundamental objects of mindfulness in daily life are the five precepts. So it's not that you keep the five precepts and then you can meditate, but keeping the five precepts is your meditation in daily life. Because um, if, you're, um, if you're breaking any of the five precepts, basically no matter how much time you spend in meditation, it's one step forward and two steps back. And the the kamma that you create when you break one of the five precepts um, is serious thing. So having, keeping those five precepts in mind is the first level of mindfulness in daily life. It's the fundamental level. And to give a simple example, a, let's say a mosquito, bites you. So the unenlightened, um, uh, unaware um, mind means someone will just like slap the mosquito without even thinking about it. So there's no humanity there. There's, there's no, um, uh, there's nothing of the Buddhist in that moment. But if you, if at the moment that your habitual reaction, your habit, is to slap a mosquito and then you stop and you, and you think, oh, I'm gonna break my precept. And that stopping at that moment, that is the arising of sati and sampajanya. And, and at that moment, the question of, is this right? Is this wrong? Is this appropriate, inappropriate? All of these, considerations can come into the mind because you created a space for them. You weren't just blindly following your habit. So you recognize and you stop. And when you stop, then you have a lot more options. You can just blow the mosquito away or, or whatever. So in daily life, you, you're creating awareness um, you're coming back to yourself. You're learning how to live your life in accordance with your principles through this mindfulness of precepts as your basic practice. And then on top of that, you can have other uh, practices. If you're um, alone, you can maybe do some body awareness or you're in a group, you can do some loving kindness practice, learning how to adapt according to the situation. But the, the fund, as I to repeat once more, the fundamental um, objects of mindfulness in daily life are five precepts. Thank you, Achan, for the answer. Now for the sixth question. Does one need to go beyond mind or thoughts to realize truth? Can we realize truth without meditation? Thank you. Um, you do have to go beyond thoughts. You have to see the space around thoughts. You have to, to, own, to live a life in your mind just full of thoughts. So that's 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 like a hell realm really, you don't really realize, but it's when you uh, can find some gaps between the thoughts and experience a clarity and sharpness of mind without thought that you can understand thinking as thinking and not just be the servant of your thoughts and emotions. 
you have to be able to see around them and to see them and to step back from thinking before you can um, think wisely and think uh, in creative and, and useful ways. So 90% of the thoughts in your minds are just junk, basically. Um, and you need to you need to spring clean, you need to sort that out um, before your mind can do the more profound work of vipassana. So I would say, um, without meditation, um, you're not going to be able to uh, experience or realize those more profound states of mind and you're, you'll never get the momentum of practice that you need to make any real breakthrough in, um, in the search for truth. I think one more question, and that would be. Okay, so for the last question, thank you for your answer, by the way. For the last question, how can a lay, pers per how can a lay person attain Sotopana when even a full-time monk cannot attain? How can one truly achieve the first level of sainthood? Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I, I um, think that that question was so well phrased. I mean, there, how can uh, a lay person Experience, um, realize stream entry um, when monks can't. It's it's more that the the monastic um, form, the vinaya, the way of life of of the monk and the nun, was designed by the Buddha himself uh, to create the optimum conditions for realization but that's all it is it's the optimum conditions and the extent to which monks or nuns take advantage of those conditions or are able to take advantage of those conditions is something else and the difference in for a householder is that the conditions um, are not designed your conditions are not designed by a buddha um, and you have many more uh, pressures and temptations and distractions. But um, the, that doesn't mean that it's impossible. It just means that it's a lot harder. So yes, it's, it's hard even for monastics with those supportive conditions it's already very difficult. And so for a householder, even more difficult. But if you don't do this, what are you gonna do with your life? You know, what's the option? What's your alternative? Just give up and uh, say, uh, it's too hard. Um, so I, I think that's not really the point, you know, whether it's, it's difficult or it's easy or there's supportive conditions or not. Um, the, the, this practice works, um, how far along the path you will progress in this lifetime is not a sure thing, but progressing even a few steps is better than regressing and going backwards. Um, so um, stream entry has been achieved by householders in the past um, and in the present, but it's always a very small number. Um, in terms of percentages, it's probably a tiny number. But, you know, um, the, I don't think that's really such a um, important consideration is, um, do you have the faith that um, in the Buddha's wisdom, and that the Eightfold Path is the path to true freedom. And if you do, then how can you not practice 
whatever the external conditions might be. Thank you very much, Ashan, for the Dhamma that you have shared today. We are really blessed to have the opportunity to listen to whatever you have said today. And thank you very much for the insights once again. We would like to invite Venerable Achan to lead us with the dedication prayer. Achan, please. To give blessing. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Yatha Variwaha Pura Paripur in Tisagarang, Ewami Waito Tinang Petanang Upakapati, Ichitang Batitang Tumhang Kipamiwa Sumichato Sapte Purento Sangapam, Janto Panaraso Yatha Manicho Tiraso Yatha Sapitio Viva Chanto. Sapharo ko vinasato matayam vatvantarayo sukhi dhikayu ko mhava apiva danasi lesa nitjang vatha pachahino chataro thamma vathante ayu vano sukhang halam. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Anumodana, Venerable Achan, for a generosity to teach us the wisdom and compassion today. The Sangha community itself is a blessing who reminds us to keep practicing the Dhamma in our daily life. We hope this occasion will benefit all sentient beings. On behalf of the KCBI, Walubi, volunteers, and all participants benefited from your teaching, this is a small token of appreciation, of gratitude towards Venerable Achan. We hope that we can listen more from you in the future. This event will never be realized without a great hummel of team working in the back. Thank you to all volunteers team. Next week, on the 8th of May, we will receive another blessing of the teaching from Venerable Tan Achan Chagino, starting from 7.30 p.m. Jakarta time. Tan Achan will speak in Chinese and we will have English, Indonesia, and Thai translation. The precious opportunity to listen to the Dhamma has come to an end. Once again, I hope we can take this as a reminder to contemplate and practice in our daily life. Sabe sata bawantu sukitata. May all beings be happy. Sukihotu namo buddhaya.
你的